Right, just before anyone thinks I'm a complete megalomaniac and I'm chairing my in session, I did tick the box and said I didn't want to do that, but here we are. And, and it's come to my attention that some, some people are playing um, best 2016 bingo, um, of which if I mention Brexit, Nature, Darwin, Liverpool, Hope, Trump, Community, 150, Boris, Thanks, Post-Truth Politics, or BES, you get a full house. And now I've just mentioned that, all of those, if anyone's playing, you've, you've won, you've got a full house. <laughs> Uh, there we go. Okay, so I'm going first, but I won't abuse my position. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about um, the work I've been doing at Cambridge on barriers and solutions to the use of conservation science and policy. Um, I was hoping to have a few more results when I sent in the abstract, but I don't. So this is more thought of provoking than actually giving you conclusive results. So I was having to think when I was doing the presentation for this about when I first started being interested in this back in 2011 when I was going to do a master's before my PhD on conservation science policy interfaces. And I remember being inspired in my third year geography undergraduate lectures by Professor Susan Owens. You might know Susan's work on the knowledge policy interface which culminated in a really good book that was out last year called Knowledge, Policy and Expertise. And I wanted to apply Susan's work in the conservation um, sphere. And when I started, there was a biggest literature on it, but nothing could necessarily prepare me for the explosion of research after 2011. And some of you who are involved in this area will know that since 2011, but a little bit before, there's been more and more interest in this area. So we can think of lots of EU projects, for example, Spiral, Biomot, Be Safe, Eclipse now, lots of work coming out of Australia, America, lots of research projects looking into the conservation science policy interface. And that's fantastic because if we as ecology researchers in the room, if our research just sits on the page of scientific journals and never influences policy or practice on the ground, then it renders the ecology research somewhat pointless. Now, I'd argue that a lot of the research on the conservation science policy interface has only really brought to the conservation audience what was already known for decades, I think, in the policy sciences. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's certainly a good thing to introduce well-known ideas to a new audience. And I think one of the ideas that's really com been communicated quite well is the idea that there, there really isn't a linear relationship between evidence and policy. Very rarely does better science equal evidence-based policy because evident policy is not made in a vacuum with only evidence um, to take, be taken into account. So it can never be purely evidence-based, as someone like Chris Sandbrook and Bill Adams would argue. Rather, evidence must be interpreted alongside another, a number of different interests, which might be competing. So poly evidence can only ever inform policy. And this, this idea has stimulated lots of good research into science communication recognizing that better science alone doesn't necessarily mean more evidence-based policy. Instead, you have to communicate science better. You might have to frame it alongside more policy-relevant, politically salient narratives so it can compete with these other interests. Um, and some of that work has led to one of the methods by which we might do that is to design decision support tools. So this is one of the emerging trends, I think, in the conservation literature and elsewhere to try and link knowledge and policy, that you could design decision support tools, whether they are software-based, app-based, websites, paper-based tools, that might communicate evidence in a usable form for your intended end user. But likewise, research into the uptake of decision support tools, and this piece of research was done in sustainable agriculture, but it can be broadly um, useful in the conservation sphere too, it's, again, it doesn't necessarily mean that better designed decision support tools, more sophisticated decision support tools, equal more evidence-based management. That doesn't necessarily translate. Instead, what you need to work out is what makes users use your knowledge, your technology. And that's not just designing a really nice interface. That is trying to understand some of these other factors on the diagram. How you build trust with your end users. How you design something that really takes account of policy needs. What do policymakers want? What are the decision contexts in which the decisions are being made? How do you facilitate peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange? 
how do you essentially co-produce knowledge more effectively? So it's within this context of there not being a linear relationship between science and policy in many cases, and the need to design decision support tools that are, of course, scientifically sophisticated, but also taking into account policy needs and be very much co-produced with users, that the piece of work that we're now doing sits. So the EU Biodiversity Observation Network project, if many of you, some of you might be aware of this, some of you might not be, the main aim of the project is to design a suite of decision support tools and then design a portal um, for which policymakers can go on to. They can have policy needs, policy questions they want answering, and a decision support tool will be there for them to answer certain questions. So you can go to this address and have a look at an initial go at the portal. And there's a range of different tools that are relevant to various policy questions, which a policymaker is supposed to go on to and be able to use quite easily. But you can judge whether the initial prototyping are good or not. I rather suspect that some of them at the moment are still too science-led and not necessarily policy-focused. One of the things we were asked to do for this project was to investigate the barriers to the uptake of evidence in policy and to suggest solutions to overcome them. And many of you might be thinking now, as I did when I first got the brief, that that's kind of been done quite a lot in the conservation science policy literature. And you'd be right, there, are lots, there is lots of work that does look at barriers to the use of evidence and suggest solutions to overcome these barriers. Now I was thinking, how are we going to do it better? And I'd argue that a lot of the papers that look at this barrier solutions idea are flawed either because the sample size is relatively small, they just do a handful of interviews with a few people, they do a bit of a literature review, they don't try, quite cover all of the actors involved in the science policy interface, or they focus far too much on Western decision-making contexts. Um, so lots of things that I felt we could improve on. So we set about to design a survey to try and understand what the barriers were to use of evidence and what the solutions might be. And we tried to make it better than some of this previous work. So we wanted to make it global in nature, not just focusing on Western decision contexts, but regions all over the world. So every continent, as many countries as we can, every region. We wanted to make sure that we asked conservation scientists, policymakers in government, NGOs, practitioners, we wanted to consult all of their views. We also wanted to make sure the barriers and solutions were linked. So if someone suggested a barrier, and then we asked, we asked for a solution to that barrier and not just random solutions. So it all started at the best Cambridge Conservation Initiative Conference in April in Cambridge, where this initial survey went out, and it also went to various other conferences and policy networks, and 134 people responded from a variety of, variety of scientists, policymakers, practitioners, uh, answered this questionnaire, which if you look at questions three and four particularly, it asked them to propose barriers, it asked them to propose solutions to those barriers, and it also asked some information about how long you've been in conservation, what your gender is, where you come from. And these were the top 10 barriers that were suggested in those, that survey. Um, they are, I can't go through all of them, but there were lots. I think there were about 30 barriers, and these are the top 10. Um, but we wanted to go much further. So we got that top 10, and we wanted to rank those barriers. So what the first survey didn't say is which are the most important. So the second survey asked um, the same people, but uh, it's been filled in by nearly 600 people now, to rank the barriers by order of importance to score them. And for all of those barriers, there are proposed solutions from the first survey that you can also score. So we've got nearly 600 responses, um, hopefully to try and get some sort of sense of which are the most important barriers, which are the most important and beneficial solutions. And as one of the barriers was language difficulties, we thought we couldn't just send that out in English. So there's lots of different language versions of this. Um, and I haven't got many results to tell you because we haven't looked at them. Now, one thing I wanted to just mention, and this might be something you can discuss at the policy networking session tonight, is I wonder if anything surprising is going to come out of this. And it's, it's odd to 
for an academic to say, maybe nothing particularly surprising might come out. Because when you read a lot of this literature on the conservation science policy interface, the same barriers and the same solutions are often mentioned. And I wonder why that might be the case. And I think possibly there could be three reasons. Either it's because the barriers are so impenetrable to solutions. As Margaret Thatcher might have said, her kind of sense of the science policy interface as scientists advise and ministers decide. Maybe they're just two completely different worlds. But I rather suspect that's true, but we, it's not the case that we can't bridge the gap. Secondly, it could be the solutions we propose just aren't very good, and we need better ones. Or thirdly, it could be the solutions are quite good, but we as a conservation community have, don't ha perhaps have the skills to take them up, or perhaps we don't have the time and the funding structures to allow us to take them up, or perhaps there is inertia to taking those up. So that's in this um, diagram here. Perhaps we know there are good solutions, but we don't want to change the way we work. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of the survey. And you can all help. So on, my, um, on the BES 2016 hashtag, on my Twitter handle, which is at D underscore Christian Rose, and on Rebecca Robertson, Eco Bexy's Twitter, there is also this survey. And there, there's multiple languages, so you can go on there and you can boost the numbers, which will please the reviewers immensely. Um, so yes, so just a few thanks to finish with. The Conservation Science Group for putting up with me for two years as a geographer. Um, I might have annoyed them as sometimes, but they're obviously very happy to see me in this picture. And then just lastly, a, a Merry Christmas. And if anybody needs some advice about how to decorate their doors for Christmas, Bill Sutherland is a really good person to ask because that's just lovely, isn't it? So do ask him for advice if you want to jazz up your group's decorations. Uh, yes, that's what I've got. You, you can decide if there's questions, you can help. If not, we can move on if there's not time. So what if one of the main barriers is simply just power in that those that hold the power simply don't want to do that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I agree that might seem a somewhat impenetrable barrier and I think that's just, there is just the case of sometimes we just won't overcome the barriers. But it doesn't necessarily mean we can't try. It doesn't necessarily mean we can't try and have conversations with those who have power to try and find ways of co-producing knowledge with them and trying to get those people in power to take conservation more seriously. It doesn't mean we can't do that. We, sometimes we might lose, but if we do that, sometimes we might win. Okay. I think we might have to move on time-wise, since I'm the chair. Okay. You can, can we take this quick? Ask me afterwards. Yeah. I know, we've got to come back. Okay, so any other questions? There might not be loads of time for questions in this session, but there's a policy networking session tonight, and there'll be some time afterwards, I think, to ask questions of people. So MX is up next, and he's talking about navigating the ecological research and policy space, which might hopefully build on some of the things I've said. Thanks, David. Um, so I, I, I've got to give a little bit of a background. My background is uh, a practitioner's uh, background. So I've uh, lived and breathed conservation for the last almost 15 years, over 15 years, and have worked in uh, a variety of places, but mostly Southern Eastern uh, Africa, and uh, now work from, from here. Um, and my talk really is is coming from a background where I've been interested in, um, at a practical level, in a conservation organization, how do we begin to start to take some of the science that's coming from universities and, um, you know, you, you, you put it out there and it makes a, a, a difference. And, um, and obviously, you sooner or later start thinking, what are the people, who are the people that are going to help us to do that? So it's a slightly uh, more pragmatic uh, um, take on this and it's been informed by conversations with uh, colleagues when we have either wanted to hire or thought we need a new person to fill a role and 
and we suddenly realized it's actually quite a, a difficult thing to do. Just as a sort of background, I think um, you find what David was talking about, the policy, the science policy interface. There's quite a lot of research looking at that. The people talk about the research implementation gap as well, and there's quite a, a bit of research around that. Um, and, and a lot of it is about how do you communicate with policymakers, how do you uh, create spaces of innovation where ideas from science and uh, uh, policy uh, inform decision making. And I think um, with where we are in, uh, as, 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 you know, as, uh, as, a, as a species where um, habitats are in danger and we're needing to, to look at the drivers of what um, is causing um, biodegradation and loss of species and be thinking of how we transform our systems. I think it's important that we continue to um, think of how we create or rather train people that will help us to achieve that system transformation. And I think, uh, like I have said in practice, as conservation organizations, um, we, we want to, to do science. We want to be led by science. So you'll find organizations like WWF, we, we continue hammering about the fact that we are a science-led organization, and all the other big uh, environmental conservation organizations, we all in some way and you know talk about either we innovating, innovation for, for WCS is, is an important part of their, their menu or their ethos, as it were. Uh, TNC talks about leading conservation with science, and uh, that's all of us are looking at it uh, uh, from that perspective. Um, but I think when you look at the structure of an organization, we try and then say, okay, can we have people that can actually drive this process forward? And then you start looking at, we create science and policy units. Uh, for example, in the organization that I'm part of, uh, WWF UK, we have a science and policy uh, unit, which is meant to bridge the gap between the science and the, the field, the science and the policy. And um, which then means that you've got to then start thinking, what kind of a person do I need to put in that sort of space to be able to help colleagues um, working on the ground uh, and academics bring the two together, uh, somehow negotiate that space and, and, and be able to, to, to bring change. And I think, uh, from an academic side, there's been quite an effort to actually begin to generate people that can occupy that sort of space. Partly, I think that's been because there is a demand from conservation organization to have more and more people that have expertise, can understand what's required on the ground. Not that, you know, those that are already there don't understand, but can understand that and, and speak to, to the science. And there have been lots of, of courses, and I think they, they will continue to, to increase into the future. And they, they do fulfill a, a, a role um, uh, for that. So I've been doing a, a study on the side because uh, a lot of my time is spent really pushing the conservation work and interviewing colleagues that have had a hiring experience um, mostly mid to senior managers, uh, and really trying to understand how, what's been your experience with hiring people in the science and policy space? How easy has it been? And um, do you find these people uh, easy? The initial, uh, as it were, um, impetus for the study was really because people kept you know, throwing their hands in the air and saying we can't find people of this sort. So trying to put uh, some flesh into that. 
So the results that I have are really preliminary, but um, they point out a number of things. So one of the things that's become clearer is, depending on who you're talking to in terms of geography, it, this, this, you will get different answers. For places like Southern Africa, uh, which I think has had a tradition of producing people that occupy that space, that are able to, to look at both science and actively participate in it, and also um, you know, uh, be able to influence policy. What, what seems to be happening is, I think, out of necessity, um, people have been able to breed innovation. People have been able to realize that actually to, to thrive in this environment and to uh, be able to bring change, we've got to take science. And a lot of them have actually been uh, the generators of the science that then take it from, from the field and then use it as evidence in speaking to, to, to policy. And so one could say that uh, with less, less hands on the deck, uh, uh, the candidates from there or people that have taken up jobs there that have a science and policy aspect have had to be more versatile and engage in that. The other aspect that seems to, to come out with uh, uh, Southern Africa is that quite, because quite a number of people that have done that uh, have become examples. So, uh, you've got a, a lot of other young scientists, young uh, conservationists that then see that as an example. And you see the, the power of an example of having somebody that's able to marry those two together. Um, East Africa has been less successful um, uh, compared to, to Southern Africa. And reasons are less clear as to why uh, that is so, but a few people have suggested to me that it's probably because it's had uh, quite a huge number of experts going in there and they're able to, to fill in gaps uh, um, around the policy science space. Um, so looking closer to, to, to the UK, um, mostly colleagues in my office and that I've uh, spoken to, interviewed. There seems to be people um, have very early specializations. Either they are uh, interested in ecology or trained as ecologists, or they're trained as policy, policy makers. So bringing those two together becomes or in policy, and so they're interested in more the, the practical uh, end of things, and uh, organizations here have generally, until probably now, uh, been able to employ uh, people that are well-trained in, in science, and th they communicate with the people that deal with the policy aspects. So they mean, it looks like um, there's a bit of, we've got resources, we can do that, we can build the teams to uh, bring the teams together, and it's all about how those different people, expertise with those different skills are able to interact and, and, uh, and move the agenda forward. Where there has been an effort to try and bring people that create teams, like I have said, a science and policy team that can bring both the science and the policy together and uh, sort of manage and navigate that interaction between those two. It seems that um, it's been quite a difficult thing and uh, those that are more experienced seem to be able to do that better and those that are younger in their careers or uh, early in their careers, that seems to be quite difficult. One of the things that has also come is there seems to be more of a division, unlike probably in Southern Africa and East Africa, of these guys will deal with policy and these guys will deal with, uh, with, with science. I think essentially one of the things that I you know, would say is probably a conclusion is that there seems to be quite um, a, a, a need to invest a lot of time and 
uh, experience for uh, in building candidates that are able to uh, both appreciate the science, uh, bring it on board, and also appreciate the, the, the policy aspects and the need for us to act and influence the decision makers um, going forward. And I think that's, that's, um, that's, uh, that's, that's very, very important to realize. And I, one of the things that seems to be quite uh, delightful when you think about this is that there is a growing recognition within universities and uh, students are being given um, opportunities to do courses, whether it's in journalism, so that they can be able to more effectively work within that uh, science and policy uh, space. And I think that needs to continue. Um, if any of you would um, have time, I would like to talk to more people that uh, have either had experience in um, working with conservation organizations or with training uh, um, students as well to, to fit into this. Thank you. Okay, questions for Abek. Um, do you think politicians' attitudes towards conservationists and scientists differ from between Southern Africa and here? And is that part of the reason why there is that kind of closer link between policy and science that you talk about in Southern Africa? To be honest, I don't think the, the policy makers uh, are any different. I think that it's been probably a difference within the, you know, you, our training, whether it's a um, conservation science training where uh, people are trained as ecologists and uh, or they're trained as uh, policy people, as it were. And because we have the luxury of having the funds to employ both, it never seems such a, a, a there never seems to be such a huge need to uh, have people that are balanced in either of those two. And those that are able to do that in a very balanced way are either doing it because of an interest um, or you know, where they are working in, it's, it's necessary to do that. Okay, thank you. Any more? I think your a key point you identified early on is the small size of the pool. Um, having been through the agent, conservation agencies in Britain, when we went from 300 to nearly 3,000 by the end of the, mm. to my career, when we were only 300 covering Great Britain, people did have to do everything. And so they did have to bridge that gap. And as it got yeah. bigger, so as you say, you got specialization, but then yeah. you got the divisions developing within the organization. So there's something to be said for just not having for too many people doing the job. Yeah, that's true. I, th I think I, there's nothing I can add to that. That's a brilliant point, actually. And I think it's a perspective that I probably uh, hadn't realized, actually, that this is um, er something that's come because of historical reasons. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for being here and for giving a, a talk on this important issue about the skills uh, the, of, of bridging science and policy. Yeah. The thing I wanted to raise is that I've recently been involved in one of the IPBES assessment reports, a global report, and the, re the report itself, it was the pollinators report. It's, it's written by scientists, but there is then a summary for policymakers, which is written by scientists but agreed to and quite closely reviewed by governments. So for me, that's a co-produced science policy document. And in the last week, I've been challenged really quite strongly by people on one particular element of that. And I was accused of not being an independent scientist because I had written a document that was politicized. So I think there's a, there's a real conflict for people like me who are trying to be independent scientists that work with policy. We sometimes get accused of not being independent and people are horrified that we, we might behave in this way, that they would work with governments. So I just wondered if, you, if you'd come across that and you had any response. I, I think there's, there's quite a lot of that and that's especially, and you could correct me, you hear quite a lot of that with scientists 
um, uh, in the worst. And because those that are in the other parts of the world, they just suddenly realize we've got to be practical, pragmatic, we've got to do this. And, and I think uh, that's a conversation for another day, but that's something that as a community we need to start thinking about, you know, should we actually be that pure? Awesome. Some of us, but not all, maybe. <laughs> I'd implore everyone to hire geographers. I was um, interviewing um, Cambridge geography applicants this week, and they all said geography, they all instinctively said the geography linked the natural and the social worlds, and they were very interested in doing that. So geographers, we can, we can do that. <laughs> right, OK. Next. Who do we have next? OK, shall I put that slide on? OK, we have Michaela next, who's going to talk about um, environmental conservation across boundaries. Has that worked? Yes. Hello. Um, so yeah, it's well recognized that we have a need for environmental conservation. I think even if we go outside of this room, it's still well recognized that we have a need for environmental conservation. Um, unfortunately, the funding isn't following that need. Um, and so what we find ourselves needing to do is to prioritize conservation actions. On the global scale, we recognize islands as of high conservation importance. Um, and on islands, we have this direct interface between the terrestrial and the marine ecosystems. And so therefore, we need to look at prioritizing uh, conservation actions across this interface. Uh, <laughs> it's changing here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very pretty. Rob, Rob, Thanks. I'll just reopen it. Yay. Okay, so this is me. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I'm a PhD student at the University of St. Andrews. Um, I'm working with the NGO ECHO on the island of Bonaire and looking at prioritizing conservation across this ecosystem boundary and linking management and funding. Um, so if, we go on, if we're looking at prioritizing conservation for islands, the biggest threat we have to island ecosystems is invasive species. Um, and so therefore, looking at controlling invasive species is important for conservation on islands. Um, it's widely recognized that eradication is the most environmentally effective solution for invasive species, but it's not always the most cost effective and it's not always socially acceptable. And so we need to look at alternatives such as fencing or continued control through reducing um, fertility or increasing, popula or increasing mortality um, to reduce population sizes over the long term. And so in order to do that, we need to look broadly at four things. Um, we obviously need to look at the ecological benefits that we would expect to see from action. Um, so we need to predict what, our, um, what the ecosystem is going to look like when we've, when we've done these conservation actions and how, uh, how much additional value those are going to give us. Um, unfortunately, we need to look at how much it's going to cost. Um, we need to do this particularly for varied budgets. Um, conservation budgets are very rarely given what you're first expecting. Um, and so having uh, varied options for varied prices um, are important so that you can go back and you can look at what you're actually going to do with half the amount of money that you're expecting. Um, we need to look at social acceptability. If you're trying to control a species that's big and fluffy and likes to stick its head into the cars of tourists, it's quite difficult to convince people that we need to get rid of them. Um, lack of social acceptability obviously increases costs, increases the time that we have to spend um, to, to control the species because we have to do a lot of social work first. Um, and if we fail to take account of it, then we can risk the, the initiative either not getting off the ground in the first place or being sabotaged or halted by uh, legal opposition by the general public. Um, and then finally, we need to look at funding opportunities. So we're not getting increases in funding um, from kind of the central pot. Uh, and so finding alternatives, such as user fees by scuba divers, um, is important for looking at where we're going to take this, how we're going to fund this prioritization. So I work on the lovely island of Bonaire in the Dutch Caribbean, about 80 kilometers north of Venezuela. Um, and it's 
terrestrial ecosystem is this dry forest, and then it's got the fringing coral reef. Um, for Bonaire, the fringing coral reef is highly important for its economy. Its uh, economy is based on dive tourism, and so it's well recognized that, that they rely on this coral reef. So they have a very, very good marine conservation program. Um, what they don't have is a very good terrestrial conservation program. We had goats, donkeys, and pigs introduced to the island in the 16th century. Um, and so what we now have is a dry forest that's very uh, overgrazed. It's got lots of small trees, um, or well, not lots of small trees, some small trees, um, and very little ground cover. And what this is leading to is increased sedimentation onto the coral reef. So as we lose root systems, we lose these things that are anchoring the soil. When it rains, we end up with the soil ending up on the coral reef, which is leading to reef decline. Um, and so it's well recognized now on the island, at least by government and conservation organizations, that we need to look at controlling these invasive species. Um, and what they're considering is uh, fencing, um, is lethal control and complete eradication. And so um, the first thing that we needed to do is to look at what the ecological impacts of these, um, of these options would have. So the first thing we did um, is we went out and mapped all of the grazer densities across the island and mapped vegetation densities. Um, we then used general linear models to look at how our grazer densities related to our tree biomass. Unfortunately, we found that goats existed in two high densities across the entire island that we weren't able to see any variation. Um, but for donkeys, we did see a negative impact. Um, so we see a negative relationship between the deep dry season donkey density index and the percentage ground cover. Um, and across the island, grazing always exceeded the levels of uh, tree biomass. So taking those models, we then looked at um, the levels of donkeys that we would expect for each of our control options. So for fencing of nature areas um, and for reducing the, the population. Um, and we find that we have improvements in ground cover for fencing and for eradication. Um, we see a larger improvement for eradication than we do for fencing. But if we're looking at lethal control, we see that um, the improvements for fencing only, I'm sorry, the improvements for lethal control only exceed the improvements for fencing if we remove 91% of the individuals. So we have to remove 91% of the donkey population before we see any input impact. And then because we're looking at islands, um, we then wanted to see what the impact is on the coral reef. And so we went and we mapped the coral reef characteristics um, and related those to vegetation characteristics on the watershed. Again, we used general linear models to assess these, um, and we found then expect the expected positive relationship between percentage ground cover and percentage coral cover. Um, and surprisingly, a negative relationship, or well, no real relationship between uh, tree biomass and um, percentage coral cover. Um, we expect this is due to the, uh, the island has very low rainfall, and so we have very long roots um, of the trees, and so they're not contributing to this stabilization of the topsoils that are the most susceptible to, to sediment runoff. Um, they're also con contributing leaf fall and, and dropping of fruit and things, which is increasing the amount of things that are there to run off. So again, when we use that model, um, we can look at, take the expected improvements in ground cover that we saw previously, um, and predict our expected improvements in coral cover from each of our options. So we can see again, if we look at um, complete removal of donkeys, we expect that should be a median percentage coral cover. Um, median percentage coral cover to be 100%. Um, and for fencing, for, for fencing of all of the nature areas, we get a median percentage coral cover of 85%. Um, and so that's an improvement uh, of, coral co of median coral cover from 46% currently. Uh, so next, we now need to look at costs. Um, costs can be particularly difficult to do um, because costs aren't reported well in the literature. And so fencing, we were able to take uh, information from existing fencing projects um, and get an estimate by scaling those up um, to 1.2 million um, to fence all of the nature areas on the island. Our estimate for donkeys is slightly more less accurate. Um, and we get an estimate from 2.9 to about $70 million. Um, so that's using the published studies for eradications, looking at the per hectare costs. Um, as it is, we found only 11 studies of ungulate eradications that reported costs on the island. 
on, on islands. Um, and so we are now working with um, specialists that work in island conservation um, to narrow that number slightly. Um, but even using these very broad numbers, we can see that eradication is going to cost at least twice as much as fencing. Um, it just may also cost 10 times as much as fencing. Um, and so then we started to look at social acceptability. We did this through um, working with experts on the island and asking them to score the acceptability of all of our options. And so we see that fencing is the most socially acceptable. We would expect it to be more socially acceptable than donkey removal. Um, what's quite encouraging is that it's also more, more socially acceptable than taking no control. So that shows the importance of um, controlling species on the island. So then finally, we want to link it to, um, to potential funding mechanisms. And so for Bonaire, scuba divers are their, um, are their main source of income, and they already pay an annual user fee of $25 to visit the national park, to visit the marine park. Um, and so we carried out choice experiments with 299 divers, where they were asked, um, they were presented with eight choice cards, like the ones presented above, um, and they were asked to choose their preferred dive site based on varied visibility, coral cover, fish decline, and annual fee. Um, and what we found uh, was that the majority of divers, so that's class one and class two, were willing to pay for improvements in coral cover as we would expect to arise from, um, from terrestrial conservation. Um, when we, so through, through analyzing that, we can find, um, we can work out what their preferences are um, and we can work out what they would be willing to pay for incremental increases in each of the, in each of the um, attributes. Um, and when we would then relate that to the expected increases that we would see from our, um, from our uh, control options, we see that we have, um, for fencing, we estimate about $107 per individual per year that they would be willing to pay for, um, uh, yeah, for, fence, for the improvements through fencing, and about $149 per individual per year for, um, for eradication. So across Bonaire, we find that fencing, although it's not the most environmentally effective option, um, provides us with the most, um, is the most likely to be cost effective and less likely to be impacted by social acceptability than eradication. Um, and fencing costs can also be covered completely by the willingness to pay of scuba divers for, um, for the expected improvements. Um, and so, we find that look, we have to look beyond just the environmental impacts. Um, we've specifically linked this to funding because that's the reason that most of our conservation initiatives fail. And so through tapping into this increase in funding that's tied very specifically to that improvement in, in, in the environment, increases the chances that we're going to be able to move from this planning stage into this implement, implementation stage. Um, and it would be greatly, greatly improved if we had more reporting of costs, which would allow us to better estimate the costs of our um, conservation initiatives. Thank you. Okay, Steve, we've got about a minute and a half questions. Any questions? Oh, there's one from anyone else? If you got rid of all the donkeys, that's a one-off cost, but fencing, you're going to have to repeat probably every 15, 10, yeah. 15 years. Did you factor that in? Uh, so the costs for fencing include maintenance for 10 years, um, but yes, you're right. Um, but it would still be, I think the social acceptability is the big problem with the eradication of donkeys at the moment, unfortunately. <laughs> one more in the middle here. Super quick, if you can. Yeah, no, that's fine. Me. Yeah, super quick. <laughs> Why are people so attached to the donkeys? Because they're cute and fluffy. Is that um, the, that's, that's the only it's, reason? It's, yeah, it's, they're not farmed, and they're all completely feral, but it is that they're, that they're cute and fluffy, and okay. they wander around the island, and they, like, like the, they stick their heads in the car windows and uh -huh. snuffle for treats. That is it. Uh -huh. And then you, um, you, you had scuba divers in your questions. What about the bird watchers as well? Because you have the parrots on the island as well. Yeah, uh, the, so... The majority of people that are coming to the island are coming to the island to scuba dive. And so mm -hmm. that's where the money is. There's not okay. really a lot of people coming solely to bird watch. So yet. you need more British people going to Bonaire to yeah. watch the parrots. Yeah, yeah. You, you all need to go and visit Echo <laughs> and go and watch the parrots. <laughs> Terrific. Great. Thank you. Thank you.
Wolfgang? Yeah. I'd be really interested to know what method of eradication of donkeys costs 2.9 as opposed to the method that costs $70 million. That would be fantastic. But that's really interesting. Okay, we've got Wolfgang that's going to talk about all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Okay, thank you very much. So how do I operate this? Okay, so the Habitat and Bird Directive, as most of you know, are the main pillars of species conservation in Europe. We have about 900 species that are directly protected. In addition, we have these uh, Natura 2000 areas that have been created. The Habitat Directive was implemented in 1992, but it took a very long time to be actually put into national laws, and in Germany only since about 2010. And since... Um, since the implementation, we can now start to look at the effect of this, and most of the studies looking at the effectiveness of um, the Bird and Habitat Directive have looked at actually the protected area network. Even though the um, directives are not really in place for a very long time, the EU has already carried out a fitness check, and the results are probably published soon, and hopefully they will be um, further um, implemented. The, the signs of this look good. Now, what I would like to concentrate on is the uh, effect on individual species. And if you look at what species are actually listed in the um, Habitat and Bird Directive, what you see is, do we have a pointer? No? Okay, no. So, um, thank you. Um, you see it's quite unequally distributed. Birds had a very good lobby in 1991, and so did bats. So in Germany, 100% of the bats and birds are listed, whereas if you're an insect uh, and not a butterfly, there are 23,000 species, of which I think one or two are um, protected. So it varies uh, strongly between groups um, whether or not a species is protected. So what does the EU law mean in Germany? It means that sectors that had previously been exempt from a species um, protection, such as construction work, now have to do an environmental impact, a species impact assessment, to see if one of these European, uh, the species protected by European law are affected. No, this is not. So I'm seeing here something different than I see there. Nice top one, not mine. Yeah. yeah, and now? Okay, sorry. So basically, the way it works is that um, the, the con a consultant is normally employed who has to first see if a species is present at a particular site. And if so, the question is, are individuals deliberately killed, injured, or disturbed? Are breeding sites or habitat affected? And if no, the project can be built. If, and if yes, then they have to ask, are there some measures not to prevent this damage, avoidance of damage, or whether you can, um, can uh, ensure the continuous ecological fun functioning. And only if, if this is not possible, then you have to apply for an exception, which is quite difficult and only when you are not granted an exception, then the project is not possible. So that's the, that's the uh, workflow. And the first important question, of course, is, um, um, is the species present? So what I would like to do in my talk is, I would to like to see, using a sample of projects, what species are actually present at construction sites, what species are considered to be affected, what conservation measures are actually taken for what species, and are species other than those listed in the directive actually benefiting from any of these measures. So the first um, um, approach we did is we selected 205 species impact assessment for completed projects from the internet in Germany. 
They uh, included a lot of different things, street construction, railway construction, wind turbine, although very few, and then we could analyze them. So the first thing you notice is that this is the percentage of projects, percentage of species impact assessment, um, which had the presence of species of a particular group. So birds basically are always present when you build something. Bats are almost always present. Um, blue me means that you, are, that you have some evidence that the species is present. Brown means that there's some evidence that there's no species. And in many cases, this is some lists that say a species doesn't occur in, in the area. So if these lists are incorrect, then of course this step of assessing the species is also incorrect. You also see some formal mistakes. The green areas are basically uh, projects where they didn't even check for the presence of a particular group. The next step is then, are the species affected? And again, this is a percentage of projects where a particular taxon was affected. And you see birds are in almost 70% of the projects affected by the um, construction work. Bats are at least in 30% of all projects considered to be affected. Mammals without bats, a little bit less. And reptiles are also almost in 20% of the project affected. Butterflies, mollusk plants basically play very little role in, um, for uh, well, uh, play very little role and it need not to be further considered. So to summarize this is that 150 projects, or so 73% um, had some species that were affected and where at least some conservation measures were implemented. And only 6% of the projects, um, the, the plans needed actually to be changed, mainly because of birds and bats. Four projects where the exception was applied for and granted, and zero projects where, where, where basically the project could not be built due to environmental concerns. Now, this is potentially a bit biased because we only got uh, reports of completed projects, so projects that were never built are actually not in there. But generally, you can say species impact assessment, they cause conservation actions, but they do not prevent construction work or major amendment. That is the conclusion from this. Now, we wanted to look a little bit more into detail and also standardize the um, type of projects we looked at, so we collaborated with the street construction authorities in Bavaria, and we got 80 individual street construction projects, mostly going around the village or enlarging a village, uh, sorry, enlarging uh, the street, and looked at what of the different species are mentioned and for what species you have what measure. And I can only present uh, some of the results. So the first thing you notice is that species that are most common at the sites are common species. And so this is the top 30 out of 295 species the list of species that occurred in like almost 100% of all of the areas. So the common buzzard is the most common species in these 80 projects, the kestrel, common pipistrelle, and you have to notice that for the two bats, for bats it's often not the, there's not evidence for the presence, but they basically do a worst case assumption, saying there are probably some bats, and then that's how the bats are sort of included in the list. So it's common species that are most commonly found. And then if we look at the measures that are taken, there's actually a lot of measures. So in these 80 projects, there were 3,062 measures altogether that were labeled conservation measures. So it's about 38 measures for each construction project. And most of these were actually for birds, and the second most were for bats. This could range from basically not cutting a tree during breeding time to building some elaborate structures for bats to cross the, cross the street. And actually, the most commonly mentioned species for which most measures were taken was the brown big-eared bat, or brown long-eared bat, Plecotus aritus. So in total, 76 measures were made just for this species alone, so in almost every project on average one. And this, again, could range from not cutting down the tree um, where it could roost to building some elaborate uh, features where it could cross a newly built street. If you look at the number of species and cases that profited that of species that were not part of the Habitat and Bird Directive, they weren't ever mentioned. 
So basically, even though, for example, wild bees are theoretically protected in Germany, they don't fall under the strict regulations of the um, Bird and Habitat Directive, so they don't actually appear anymore in any of the description of conservation measures. So common species are very common, and the question is how many measures we have for species that are differently frequent, and the answer is the more common you are, the more likely you are that you have uh, a measure for you. So this is the percentage of projects where a species occurred, and this is the number of, spe of measures that are made for one particular species. And you see there's a nice positive correlation. And if you then see what kind of groups they are, you see that um, the yellow is the birds, there are lots of birds um, that are protected, that for a given uh, level of occurrence, bats attract a higher number of measures than birds do, but still birds do attract the majority of all the measures um, that are done in conservation for reconstruction works. So I was very disappointed for this. We protect common species with a lot of money. We don't do much for the rare species. So then I talked to the people from the street construction authorities and they said, well, actually this result shows that it works because it's really when the routing is made, when the habitat directive really makes a difference. So that the routing is not through the um, uh, highly valuable habitats and therefore it's only the common species that are affected by the construction work. So this was last week, so then I tried I have to check this, so I went back to the reports, and basically the normal cases you have like a city where they want to have the street around the city, and there are normally three or more routings, and there's a possibility that it either goes through an N2K area, or maybe somewhere else where you don't have a species affected by the habitat directive, and I was looking for whether actually this effect is true, that the habitat directive avoids a routing through the um, uh, N2K areas, but actually that's not what I found. So basically, um, there was basically not a single case, this is only 30, I have to admit, where basically because of the habitat directive they said we can't take this routing. Um, in fact, there were like the vast majority, um, the, the habitat directive species um, played no role, even if the, um, we call it FFH in Germany, if the N2K area was affected. And even if it's discussed so that there is some damage to FFH areas, then they would still um, build the route through what is best from a perspective of street construction. So to conclude, the EU directives uh, put species conservation on the agenda in sectors where it was previously ignored, for example, construction work in Germany. And the analysis of the building project shows that conservation measures are regularly recommended, so the whole industry of building something for species. But the construction work itself is rarely, if ever, prevented. Most conservation measures in street construction works were aimed at birds and bats. No measures are taken for species not mentioned in the directives, and they may only be benefit indirectly, but there's no proof that this actually happens. And so with respect to the construction projects, the habitat and bird directives really benefit common species. Thank you very much. So are there no fish on the habitat directives? Because on your graphs, it's everything except fishes. Uh, can you repeat? Sorry, I didn't understand. Fish? Are there any fish on the habitat directives? Because on your graph, there's, there's none. Uh, yes, they are, they are fish, but the streets are mostly not built like across the lakes or so. So there are probably very few bridges among, okay. among my cases. Thank you for this beautiful presentation. I'm equally interested about aquatic organism because what we expect to you 
to talk about uh, effects of construction work on lives in the aquatic environment. Yeah, as I said, uh, like the most of the building projects are on land, and in, in, in the cases I reviewed, there were non aquatic projects there. Um, there are probably other studies, actually, I know of other studies who looked at the effect of restoration measures of rivers on aquatic organisms. Okay, great. Any other questions? Save them up for after. Thank you. Yes, do you want that? <laughs> awesome. Everyone close their eyes for a second to make sure we don't ruin a presentation to check this works. There we go, it's working. <laughs> Excellent. So now we've got Sarah who's going to talk about how decisions are made in conservation. Thank you. Um, so I'm talking today about how decisions are made in conservation, and I think some of the previous people speaking have actually kind of set up my talk quite nicely because they've talked about evidence and policy things like that. Um, but the reason I kind of got interested in this um, is that I'm really interested in the way kind of individual people work. Um, and so looking into sort of conservation and decision making in conservation, um, and I, I felt like there was a lot of focus on how decisions should be made. So there's a lot of, there's a, I mean, I'm sure you're all aware of the huge literature out there on prioritization, whether that's spatial priorities, whether that's biodiversity hotspots. We even got the IUCN red listing, which is about saying which species are most in decline or which species have got those smallest populations, things like cost-benefit analysis. And they're all there to try and help people make those decisions about what to conserve, where to conserve it, maybe direct those limited funds that we know so much about in conservation, that limited time, the limited money that we've got. Um, and at the moment, as people have said, there's a real drive to support evidence-based conservation. I think this is, I think it's really important. It's really important that we make the best possible decisions with the limited resources we have. Um, but I sort of looked at it from a different perspective. I thought, well, everybody seems to know that. Everybody's saying, yes, we should make these evidence-based decisions. People working in the field, yes, we should do this. Why isn't that actually happening? And I thought, instead of looking at and asking people, what are the actual, what are the barriers for why you're not doing this? Take a step back and have a look at how people actually make decisions in the field. So to do that, I sort of went into the kind of literature on decision-making in psychology. Um, so to see how primed you are as an audience, have any of you seen or read this book? A few of you, great, so you know exactly what I'm talking about, that's great. Um, if you haven't seen or read this book or heard about it, um, basically it's a really interesting popular science book explaining two different systems of decision-making. So the first one, of these is system one, or sometimes called intuitive decision making. So this is when we use our experience, emotions, values, gut feelings. So an example of this would be when you see somebody that you know, you can't stop yourself recognizing their face. Your brain just does that. You can't pretend, you, you can pretend you don't know them, but you know you know them and you're blanking them. You can't stop your brain from knowing that. So that's an example of a sort of intuitive decision. And then the other sort of decisions you can have are system two decisions. So these are planned decisions. They're more analytical and they're sometimes called rational, but of course, just because a decision is analytical and planned, it doesn't necessarily mean it's rational. So an example of this, if you could just in your head times 64 by 125, yeah? That what you're doing right now, that is system two thinking, that's system two decision making. It's something that unless you're kind of insanely good at mental arithmetic, you can't just do that. The answer just doesn't come to you immediately. Um, and we can think about this as well. It's not just that some things are decision one and some things, some things are system one and system two. It can change throughout our lifetime. So if any of you, for example, are birders, Perhaps you remember when you first went out looking at birds, you took your bird book, you're listening to a song, you're rifling through that book, trying to find out what bird you've just seen or heard. But by the time you've done that so many times, you build up all that experience, and it gets to that stage where it's almost like that facial recognition, where you hear the song of a robin, and you can't stop yourself 
from knowing it's a robin. You just know that that is what you're listening to. So those are these two different types of decision making. And I thought about it in the context of sort of conservation evidence and decision making in conservation. And if you think about that kind of scientific prioritization, conservation evidence, the only place where that can really have an impact is actually in this system two planned decision making. Over time, that might become automatic, it might become intuitive, but in terms of getting that science into the way people make decisions, it can only go in through this route of planned decision making. So with that in mind, I thought, great, so this is where science-based conservation decision making can happen. What are the situations in which those, when are people using this system two decision making, and when are they using system one decision making? Um, so luckily, I got a small grant from Valuing Nature, which um, they're downstairs, go and talk to them, um, really great. But what I did was to try and find out when these different types of decision making are used by conservation professionals. Um, I used semi-structured interview <laughs> interviews with con oh dear, conservation practitioners. And I'm struggling over that a little bit because you can see I've got conservation practitioners and conservation professionals. These aren't necessarily the same things. And I actually started off going, I'm going to talk to the practitioners. I'm going to talk to the people on the ground, making those decisions day to day. They're out there. And the more I talk to them, the more I realize that it's never one single person making a decision. It's always a big group of people. There's lots of tiny little decisions that come together to make what species are we focusing on, what method are we going to use. So I started broadening this out to what I call conservation professionals, by which I mean anybody who is working within decision making and conservation in whatever way. So that might be people making decisions about what projects to fund. That might be people working in local government, that could be NGOs, anyone who's going to make a decision that contributes to what species, where and how I wanted to talk to. So that's what I talked to them about. How did they decide which species to conserve, where to conserve them and how they did that. And then I recorded, that's why we've got the recorder up there, I recorded all these interviews, I had them transcribed, um, and I analysed them some, using something called applied thematic analysis. Um, so what this is, is basically you go through all those interviews and you start highlighting those areas which you think are examples. You've already got your themes, so in my case my two themes were decision one, system one and system two types of decisions and highlighted examples of when that happened and then started to try and look for patterns in when those different sorts of decisions were happening. Um, so here's just a little example. These are these type two, type one, sorry, intuitive decisions. Um, so the first example, I talked to someone, this here is the Heinen Gibbon. Um, very few of them left, uh, you know, sort of Less than 100 individuals left in the wild. They've literally been clinging onto the edge for decades. But people are really dedicated to working with them and trying to stop those declines. So I talked to someone who was involved in this in the 70s, and they said, I just don't think I'd have ever given up on the gibbon. It seems too big a psychological step to take. So for them, no matter what the evidence was saying about how this gibbon was not worth it, they were definitely all going to die off. They, they just couldn't give it up. They really believed in the gibbon. Um, and I've popped that on there because recently I have also foolishly got involved with this same gibbon species. <laughs> so I'm yet another person who is, um, you know, just can't give up on this gibbon that everyone's sort of rationally saying, give up, it's going to die, let it go. Um, so that's one type of the sort of intuitive decision. Um, and then there's also kind of that personal experience and expertise. So I talked to someone who's looking to reintroduce beavers into the UK. She's got a lot of experience working with beavers, seeing the kinds of habitats where they live, kind of places where they don't live in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, well, Europe, obviously, mostly because of different species elsewhere. But um, she's been looking at these habitats and she said that you know there just wasn't the right habitat available to sustain beavers in the long term. So this is when she went to see a site that someone else had recommended. That was partly gut feeling, but then also knowing what sort of basic requirements that beavers wanted. So she's got this experience. She's seen where beavers are before. She doesn't need to do a detailed, you know, 
survey that would cost a lot of time and money if she can see that there's something missing in that environment that beavers always have where they build their dams. So, so examples of these type two plan decisions, and I've got up here a picture here um, of the bird conservation, so from the conservationevidence.com, there's a few people in the audience I know very involved in that. Um, so I think this is perhaps where that kind of evidence can come to play more. And these kinds of planned decisions, as I'm calling them, um, seem to happen when there's more uncertainty about what to do. So maybe there isn't that much information about what's available, um, or maybe it's people who just don't have that experience I talked about on the previous slide. So somebody working in the National Park said, what a management plan is for is so that someone who's fresh to the job, who's never been to the site before, can pick it up and say, okay, that's what needs to be done. So people get that running start. They don't have the previous experience of what that site is like. They don't know the kind of things that are unique and special about that site, but they can use the management plan to find that out. And then the other time people talked about when using these kind of evidence-based plan decisions was to persuade. So this is when there were differences of opinion about what was best to do. Um, so this is an example of somebody working on species conservation. So they've now got a really good reputation about evidence based science, and that actually supports them when they're trying to persuade people about what they should actually do. So they say, you know, if we're making a point about something and we have to be firm on it, people will naturally know now that we have the evidence to support that if they push us. So using that evidence to support against people who have differing opinions about what is best to do. Um, and obviously, I've said these are the two different types of decisions, but obviously it all doesn't just happen in a vacuum. So there's a lot of other things that influence decision made. Everybody said it's not one single person making a decision. There's a team of people, there's the policy, there's the environment, there's uh, you know, the money that's available. And this particular person is an ecological consultant. So they said they can't do anything if their client is not interested. So they will try their hardest to push conservation actions. But if their client is not interested, ultimately they're the one paying and they can't do anything about that. So um, I've just been told I have one minute. So I, <laughs> this is, oh, so, okay. Um, when might we expect conservation evidence to be used? So I think that based on what the people I found from the people I've talked to, I think that would be when there's uncertainty about what to do. So whether there's diverse opinions, so maybe there's multiple stakeholders or decision makers, and also perhaps when decision makers lack expertise or experience um, about the particular context in which they're making that decision. Um, I'd like to emphasize that this is based on talking to a sample of people. If you disagree with me and think I have completely missed the point, please come and talk to me and tell me that I have, because I'd be really interested to hear about how you make decisions as well. Um, oh, I'm so sorry, they didn't click down, did they? There you go, that is what I've just said. <laughs> clicked onto the screen so you can read it as well. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody who has already talked to me. As I say, if you think I'm wrong and you want to tell me why, do come and talk to me. Um, and I've also got an undergraduate research project um, running. She's trying to look a little bit more into how people decide what to conserve. If you want to participate in that, then please do follow that link. Thank you. Talk, there's an invitation now to disagree with that. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> um, do you ever think that perhaps people. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I was just going to yell. Um, thank you. That was really, really interesting. Um, do you ever think that sometimes people are really certain about what to do, but they're also completely wrong? Oh, absolutely. Um, so <laughs> that kind of is, is going off that type one decision making process. But, you know, it's, it's going off their gut feeling, but actually mm. it should be shifted into type two, and maybe how do you do that? Mm. Well, I guess the thing is, if they are certain that they're doing the right thing and they're making that kind of experience-led decision, those are not the people who are going to be going out and searching for evidence to prove themselves wrong. So although it would be wonderful to get them to make evidence-based decisions, that impetus is not going to come from them. Okay. Super. Sorry, I'm going to have to move on. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to Keith now. Let's get his presentation up. Another interesting sounding talk on if has the search for conservationists 
evidence become too rigorous for its own good? Let's just check that work again. Yeah. The trouble with a provocative title is you get an audience, but you never know if it's going to turn into a lynch mob. Right, well, we'll see. Um, there's, we've probably had nearly two decades now of a uh, very active promotion of the idea that we need more conservation evidence. Um, and I got a bit involved with one such exercise over the last summer uh, with, on woodlands, and this is very much from a woodland perspective, and it may not apply to anything else, but as I say, that's all I really know about. And, and the thing I was involved with was quite clear, we're not making decisions for you, but we're telling you what evidence there is or isn't about the effects that your planned actions could have. Great, I can find out something about conservation. Um, well, in Britain we could do quite a lot about coppice, and the, what I found out was we found no evidence for the effects of tree coppicing on forests. I thought, hang on, <laughs> something wrong here. Um, so, let's go back a bit. Uh, why, did, why are we interested in conservation evidence? Where did this movement come from? And these are a couple of studies back in the, you know, over 10 years ago now, from Andrew Pullen and Bill Sutherland. And essentially they were looking at what evidence people used to draw up their management plans. And as you can see that looking, practitioners didn't use primary scientific literature much at all. That's indicated by the red arrow. An awful lot was based on traditional management or uh, common sense. Um, and I think actually the position has probably not changed much since. Now, it's worth stressing that as far as I, as I remember these studies correctly and looking at them again, they didn't actually, neither study suggested that the plans that were being produced were actually rubbish. They may have come to the right conclusions, but they weren't necessarily using the sort of hard scientific evidence as a basis for the decisions. They may have been using type one uh, decision making rather than type two. So why weren't practitioners using um, primary scientific data? Well, there could be two reasons, two obvious reasons. One is because there wasn't much of it about in the primary literature. And this could be because it's not the sort of thing that gets you a nature paper. If you write, find an innovative form of management or something that really makes a difference in conservation, OK, you might get a nature paper from that one where your study showed that this work did this on this site. But the poor sod who tries to repeat that over 30 other sites to show that what you've showed is generalizable, that is not likely to get into nature because you're repeating something. Um, and somebody who writes a, a really nice descriptive account of exactly what they did and what happened. Oh, well, we don't like descriptive papers in peer-reviewed journals. So it might be that stuff is not getting done, written up because of that, or it could be because conservation problems are often wicked. And I'll say a bit more about that later on. But the second reason why practitioners might not be using um, primary literature is because it's not available. And if you like, that's the issue that's been addressed over the last 10 years or so through conservation evidence and through systematic reviews. So this morning, I went to the agricultural session and uh, someone dealing with some systematic reviews there of agricultural stuff had sort of hundreds of papers dealing with their interventions. Well, this was a very... This is my very quick analysis, and I think I'm, I may have missed some of the, the numbers may not be quite right, but you can see that within this forest conservation synopsis, um, which is worldwide, most of the interventions where they found anything, they'd got less than five papers. And for those that are, for 
Studies dealing with Northern Europe, which might be the ones most relevant to Britain, uh, well, as far as I could see, there was only one intervention which had five papers picked up. So on that basis, one would say there's not a lot of evidence in the primary literature that's going to be useful. Now, actually, things are, I think things were missed off because of some of the, the ways of using keywords um, and maybe not going into some of the forestry literature. Anyway, so there may be more, but perhaps there's not going to be anything like the amount that is appears to be available for agriculture. So we can't necessarily draw much in the way of sensible conclusions if you've only got one or two studies. Um, systematic reviews... Transparent, repeatable process, but they're time-consuming and uh, possibly only going to be good value for money if your specific interventions are expensive or contested, if you're going to justify the effort you evolved. And they also depend on having clearly defined, answerable questions. So what systematic reviews have been done on forestry, in the forestry conservation world? Well, here was one which was quite a good question, what are the effects of wooded riparian zones on stream temperatures? We've got a clear subject, a single intervention type. Is the riparian zone wooded or not? And the measurable outcome, change or difference in temperature. And I think they got about 20 studies that they could use for that. And it, it depended. <laughs> but generally, it, it was, at least it was a reasonable sort of you know, they felt they could make some conclusions. Now, this is a more typical conservation question that was thrown at the systematic review people. Are current management recommendations for saprozytic invertebrates effective? Well, I'd like to know that answer. But when they had a go at doing it, you can see that they, it wasn't very easy to come up with any sort of quantitative answer. Although there was a lot of good qualitative assessment then done in a wider literature review as part of that process. Because it's a wicked question. What cyprosylic environments are we talking about? Because that will affect whether someone feels the result was good or not. All species, rare species, certain indicators of continuity of Deadwood habitat, just beetles, which is commonest group done, or are you going to include flies as well? What management recommendations for fallen wood, standing dead trees? What counts as, what's the comparative state? Effective conservation for these invertebrates compared to what we think a natural forest might be, compared to what woods are now, compared to traditional management? And what counts as effective? Keeping all the species? Increasing populations? All of these things interact. So not surprisingly, it's difficult to get a sort of coherent picture out of a range of studies. Thank you. So where, how can we improve things? I think one thing that we need to be clear on is that conservation and ecological outcomes are not the same. And that most of what's in the, pra in the scientific literature is dealing with ecological outcomes, not necessarily the conservation ones. So you could study the ecological impact of those cattle grazing in that piece of woodland. The conservation impact would depend on whether you were interested in the plants growing in that glade, the lichens growing on the trees in the background, or the bats in the wood. And we spent about three years trying to decide whether grazing was a good or bad thing for that site because the bats in the holly, well, like the holly, and the lichens on the trees didn't like the holly because it's shading them out, and the woodland type is an Annex 1 woodland type under the directive, and the bats are an Annex 2 species. So if you put grazing back in there, 
you're buggering up one or the other. So, what are we going to do? Lots of new woodland experiments? No, I don't think so. Because they're costly in money, but more importantly in time. To answer the questions now that we want for experiments, we needed to have set up those experiments probably 10 or 20 years ago. And I don't think it's going to happen. So we've got to make, I think, better use of what might be called circumstantial evidence, which, at least in some of the early reviews, tend to get rather heavily downgraded. So it's the stuff that's in non-peer-reviewed journals, correlative studies, long-term monitoring results, and expert assessments. That conservation review had no reference at all to the late, great Oliver Rackham, and yet I suspect most conservation practitioners would love to have him go around their site and give him get some ideas from that. Experience um, clearly has its place in conservation, but we should not promote wider use of action based on experience alone. Well, no, but experience might often be better than experiments conducted in a totally different system. If a lot of what we're dealing with are wicked problems which depend on the particular context. And so the people who manage sites quite often know what they're doing. Even if it's not formally written down, they will have the memories of what has worked over those past years. Yeah, the feed fertilities did do well this year. They didn't do well the previous year because it was a bad winter or the contractor came in at the wrong time. And this is what is often known as traditional knowledge. And in developing countries, ecologists going in have often stressed how they need to use traditional knowledge. Perhaps we need to get better at using it in with our sites as well. So we've perhaps got to start with where are, the, where are the things that we think are definitely going wrong in conservation and concentrate on the interventions for those. We've got to try and separate out these, what are the conservation outcomes which may be very context dependent from the ecological components to which we can get perhaps clear-cut answers from the literature or from experiments. And I think because context and interactions are likely to be critical, maybe we've got to look at a different branch of science and some of the social sciences where, again, you can't do experiments on peoples and communities quite as easily as we happily go and chop down a load of vegetation. And so they have to approach some of these questions in a slightly different way. And maybe some of those sort of techniques may be what we need to work into the next generation of conservation evidence searches. And I'll leave you with this thought. Usefulness versus rigor. Researchers want rigor because that's what academia is based on. Practitioners want usefulness. And 80% right for 20% of the costs may be good enough for a lot of conservation purposes. Thank you. OK, we've got two minutes for lynching. I mean, questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, let's start with Bill. Why not? Okay. Uh, I enjoyed that. Thank you, Keith. The, um, uh, there are lots and lots of examples of how evidence has shown that common practice doesn't work. And it's great that we have bat bridges built over our motorways as an example of the folly of not using evidence and how to waste hundreds of thousands of pounds in doing so. The, um, to me, the, the way in which evidence works is you want to take the evidence and combine that with your values and you combine that with your experience. And that's where Oliver Rackham comes in the Oliver Rackham type stuff, you know, he's got good ideas, but he hasn't tested anything. And I think we need to make that distinction very clear. And I think being, keeping the evidence clear and separate seems really important. So to me, the secret is that practitioners should just routinely test an intervention a year. 
And there are lots of interventions in terms of tree planting and effectiveness of different means of tree planting where we haven't got the evidence, and it'd be really easy for practitioners to do that. And just by biting off small bits like that, I think we could massively improve the database. And I'd, I'd like to think that's, that's the way that we'd both be very happy with, and that would result in a much larger database. Yeah, my response to that is, um, here we are sitting in academia saying, OK, practitioners, Give us, give us your data. <laughs> we're, throwing all, we're throwing the work onto them. And they're saying, well, actually, why should I spend another two days writing this up? Because I'm happy with it's working on my site and the thing. And, and in a way, we perhaps need to, you know, why, we need to get out there and, and collecting it from them. So I'm going to have to stop. Yep. If there's any more arguments, then you can have it with Keith afterwards. Okay, last talk of the day. Um, from PJ. Oh, no, there's, there's people coming in. Okay, so PJ is going to talk about unlocking the flow of biodiversity data for decision-making in Africa. Yeah, don't go. I know it's been cold in this room uh, all day, so thanks to those of you who have stayed. Um, so I'm PJ Stevenson. I'm the chair of a new uh, specialist group set up by IUCN for species monitoring, which aims to try and improve conservation through enhancing the flow of data to the people that need it. And this group actually arose from some work I was doing when I was still at WWF, um, and indeed working with IUCN to try and crack some problems we had, which was essentially why do so many red list assessments for species have so little data? to be able to conduct the assessments? And how do so many conservation NGOs like WWF and their partners, how do they struggle so much to get data uh, to monitor uh, and assess the impacts and outcomes of their programs? And so what I'm going to talk to you about today, OK, we've got that problem again. I see things differently to here. Is it? OK, sorry, I'm shouting out. It's very, we have this funny sync thing going on here, which is converted. Can we try and resync? Is it better if I use that? I've put my timer on pause soon, so. <laughs> Okay, it still looks a bit different to me, but anyway, okay, so I will look at that one. Okay, so I'm going to present um, today the results of some work that I did when we were at WWF, um, specifically looking at Africa, um, where we were trying to identify the problems um, with data flow in Africa, and this was uh, around a workshop uh, WWF held with UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Center during the uh, conference of the parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity, so the CBD COP, um, the one in 2014 in South Korea, um, which was in fact one of the first uh, stakeholder assessments of African biodiversity data needs. And then some of the work I'm going to present now as well is supplementary information from a bigger review uh, we did of lessons from WWF, working with a whole range uh, of different partners. So, um, in terms of then the uh, African data needs, we used a very high-tech, innovative, statistically robust methodology that I call sitting in a room and talking. Um, and we had 42 participants from a range of different agencies, but key to this was representatives from 20 African states, CBD focal points, who on the ground in their countries are trying to monitor biodiversity. And we basically work with them to try and answer three questions. What decisions require biodiversity data? Why are some decisions not using data? And what are the potential solutions to ensure data are available? We then followed that up with a literature review to come up with some conclusions on the major factors enabling the flow of biodiversity data into decision making in Africa. Okay, so the decisions uh, that uh, our African colleagues came up with are quite numerous, as you can imagine. So biodiversity data is needed for the development of environmental resource legislation, planning and budgeting for research, resource management across sectors, anything from protected areas to fisheries to water management, 
transboundary and global collaboration in managing shared resources, sometimes under the context of MEAs, access and benefit sharing in the control and licensing of resource use, whether it's hunting or mining or, or some such things, and mitigating human impacts on the environment through resource exploitation, invasive species, or also health issues such as those around Ebola. And last but not least in this summary, mitigation of resource-related conflicts and human-wildlife conflict. So a lot of different decisions in African countries that need biodiversity data. What sort of biodiversity data do they need? Well, the, the basics, essentially. Species populations, distributions, offtake, trade, uh, uh, threat status, and then habitat cover and distribution, and then, in most cases as well, information around protected areas and their management. So before I discuss the challenges, and as you can imagine, we came up with quite a few, it's also worth noting at the outset that there are actually quite a lot of data sets relevant to Africa. A number of the big global data sets on biodiversity, species, and protected areas have African data sets. And then there are some specific databases um, either relating to the Albertine Rift or fish also focused in Africa. And a number of African governments have their own statistics bureaus around biodiversity as well. Okay, but there are challenges, and one of the biggest ones is there are gaps. There are gaps nationally and globally in geographic, taxonomic, and temporal data coverage. One of the best examples of this, and this is where I needed a pointer, but never mind, um, this is a survey done a few years ago on the Living Planet Index, a database full of vertebrate species, and as you can tell, there are some huge gaps right in the heart of the Congo Basin, the Amazon Basin, and in other tropical sites as well. Um, there's also a lot of, there are many blockages to data access experienced by people that should use data. This is caused, all right, there are capacity issues. Everybody's always talking about lack of capacity and resources. But also sometimes even when data is available, people don't have the ability to be able to process that, to use it in a, in, in a way that's of use to them. And the lack of harmonization, people using different measures, uh, even within the same country, uh, is very complicated and confuses things. Um, and then at the, at the end of the day, so many decision makers just get no data of use. Even if it's data, it doesn't come at the right time, it's not in the right format, and they just can't use it. Okay, these challenges then lead to poor uh, data use and poor reporting. Uh, this is from a study a few years ago that showed basically only about one third, of Afri uh, one third of all CBD countries that report use any sort of data at all. And our work also underlined the fact that there are particular gaps in a lot of CBD reports from African countries as well. And this is pretty scary stuff because this is a serious convention that um, most governments on the planet uh, are trying to report on. Okay, so Africa-specific problems, because a lot of those are generic. There's a lot of, there's a, it's a big problem in Africa frequently for cross-sectoral and inter-agency collaboration. And in some cases, we found examples where the structures, the government or local government structures in Africa were even blocking and causing problems themselves for the use of data. There's also a lot of, uh, a lack of dialogue between decision makers and data providers. And as you might imagine, in many cases, because it's not a priority, uh, inadequate uh, funding. Uh, and in many cases, uh, a lot of our African delegates felt as well there were weak partnerships with donors. In fact, they were often complaining that a lot of the relationships with donors uh, were not equitable. They were kind of a little bit top down on the donor side. And of course, we all know there's no Wi-Fi in the middle of the Congo Basin. So, uh, you know, it is difficult sometimes for people to get access to some of these internet-based uh, databases. Okay, sorry, this is very confusing because I see a different thing to you. What we did, we took all this information and we decided the best way to summarize the issues here, the enabling conditions that are needed, basically revolve around data availability, data usability, willingness to use data, and then the capacity in order to do all of those. So let me talk about data availability. Um, so one of the key things that we need in order to improve this is the use of more harmonized measures. If more and more people within a country and between countries are using the same sorts of measures, it will make data flow easier because people will be collecting the same sort of data in the same formats. And there are lots of now standardized protocols and ways of collecting a lot of that biodiversity data I was talking about. Um, 
Also, there's an issue. We need to fill some of the gaps in the indicator, indicator data, uh, the indicator set. There aren't currently good measures for a number of ecosystem services or human benefits uh, from conservation as well. But one of the key things we need to continue is the current drive to make existing data more openly available. A number of institutions and, and initiatives are out there to make data freely available. We need to expand on those. Citizen science is discussed a lot. Um, you know, there are great examples of like eBird, where I'm told by BirdLife International that like 10 million observations go in a month. That seems incredible. Um, there are also some nascent um, citizen science programs in uh, Africa as well, iSpot being one example. Um, what we found in Africa and what we highlighted in our paper, though, is often in Africa, citizen science needs a bit more front-loading of resources and effort in capacity building in tools in order to work. Okay, moving right along in terms of usability, uh, what, two issues we mentioned. Scientists and decision makers need to do two things a bit more. They need to produce derived products, produced data in synthesized reports that can actually be used by people to take decisions, so in a, a language that's understandable. And then also, increasingly now, dashboards. People are using dashboards. This is a NatureServe dashboard, which is freely available, where people can look at biodiversity data. Uh, at WWF also, we introduced a series of dashboards to track progress in our priority uh, places and priority species. And what we found is that where data is in a format that's more easy to interpret and use, decisions are actually made with that data. Another issue about data usability is actually getting decision makers and data collectors to work together to develop a joint research and policy agenda, to, to promote interdisciplinary research, and also to build on the sort of science policy interfaces that are already out there uh, to put in place structures and incentives for interactive dialogue. Now, there's a lot of scientific discussion out there about science policy interfaces and boundary organizations, but what we actually need, it all boils down to having more people sitting in the room talking to each other, the people collecting the data, and the people who actually want to use it so that they can plan together and make it work from both sides. Okay, willingness, we also think if that happens, if there's more dialogue, we will also see people more willing to use data. Um, and indeed, the science community can help with that, especially, especially countries with a social science uh, sort of pedigree, if like, should investigate further the conditions that enable the use of environmental data in decision making. And we've heard some thoughts about that earlier in this session as well. And we need to build on success stories where biodiversity data is linked a little bit more to biodiversity. I mean, one good example I often give is the conservancy approach in Namibia. It's an approach where people manage land communally for uh, wildlife. They harvest the wildlife to profit the um, local communities. The idea is it's supposed to be a bit win-win for people and biodiversity. And in fact, from Namibia's own CBD reports, you can see that there's a continued increase in revenues to the people and increasing or stable wildlife populations as well. So there you've got the biodiversity measures and the human benefits, actually, the two agendas coming together. Okay, and then capacity, I won't labor because it's pretty obvious. This really is stating the obvious, but we need more resources allocated to this sort of thing. Um, I mentioned partners and donors before, but also a lot of African countries could profit more from the existing opportunities that are out there, um, largely in the context of CBD, but there are also, also various biodiversity observation networks that are offering support in this as well. But I think more importantly, the world's community of NGOs or CSOs and the academic community could do more as well to help a number of African nations with the costs associated uh, with data collection. Okay, so my conclusion, so this is my last slide, so don't panic. Um, okay, so this isn't rocket science, a lot of this, but this is what we got from the stakeholders themselves. We do think that mainstreaming biodiversity into decision making can enhance sustainable development and halt biodiversity loss. The enabling conditions, as I said, revolve around availability, usability of data, willingness to use data, and enhanced capacity. And I think what we would like to see is more governments, NGOs, and academic bodies working together in Africa to test a few science policy interfaces in the African context to see what we can get working. And also, last but not least, I mean, you hear a lot these days about the sustainable development goals. There, there are environmental components to those. There aren't as many environmental targets or indicators as we'd hoped. But 
most governments on the planet are soon going to be reporting back on those and trying to implement. And it does give us, I think, an opportunity probably to encourage people to collect and use data from different sectors at the same time. And that is a good opportunity, I believe. So just to point out again, most of the work that I presented here is written up and you'll be able to understand it far more coherently than I presented in that rushed presentation. And if you want to see what we are now doing at IUCN to enhance data uh, use, uh, you can look us up on the website. Thank you very much. Sorry, she's going to shout. <laughs> thank you for a very um, interesting talk. I just wanted to uh, pick up on the citizen science point and um, actually more make a point than a question just to say that the British Ecological Society supported um, myself and Rosie Trevelyan, for instance, from the Tropical Biology Association to, to kind of conduct a similar exercise to the one you've described with putting people, gathering people together and um, talking about opportunities and benefits for citizen science. And it was really revealing that um, there are many parallels with the rest of the world in terms of such opportunities and challenges. Um, but it was really interesting to hear your talk because I think the, the data sharing side was a really important one that um, seems to be absolutely core and critical, but yet we still have a long way to go. And I wondered if you could perhaps suggest what would be the, the next main priority, what would be the main thing to do? You've mentioned capacity building, but is there something really specific that researchers could take on board? I think, I think it is moving forward, like I said, there's two things. One, it's understanding a little bit more, and we heard a bit earlier in the session there are efforts to do that, but understanding a little bit more why in places there are blockages that they are. I mean, we've identified some, and I, I refer back to a colleague earlier who was saying maybe we're actually just not coming up with the right solutions. But there is a sense, there's a lot of literature on science policy interfaces and what could happen. I don't think that's really being tested properly yet in the African uh, context. But a lot of it is about people actually making an effort. I know still there's a lot of science going on uh, from researchers funded in like the US or Europe or whatever that still aren't really giving as much back in the countries they're working in. I would like to see more people thinking a little bit more about how can they, as they do their research, build capacity locally and, and, and help maintain that a bit as well. So. I mean, one of the things that I was shocked by was that, um, that even when there's projects going on within a country run by African scientists, their data is often held elsewhere, <coughs> and they don't necessarily have the full access to their own data. And to me, that seemed to be a really big priority, that helping to build the infrastructures using sort of web-based databases, et cetera, could really make a big difference at that sort of the ground, if you like. Yes, I agree. Good. Okay. It'll be super quick. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. And uh, looking at this work, majorly on Africa, I'm shocked that throughout your presentation, no mention about Nigeria with data collection. And I'm from Nigeria. Uh -huh. And I would love to see presentation about what we do in Africa. And I know we have quite a lot of data on biodiversity in the country. Thank you. No, I think, and just to, to say, for a start, one, Nigeria wasn't represented in our workshop in those 20 countries. I didn't list them, they were very long. Uh, but also, we weren't saying that there's no data anywhere. We're just saying that in most cases, it's inadequate. And the, a lot of the people who need it and a lot of the CBD focal points that want to put more data into their reports just aren't getting access. And sometimes we're finding some problems. But at, that's why I showed like the Namibia example. I appreciate it's the other end of the continent from you. But just to show that there is hope, there is some good work going on out there. It's not all bleak. And we did come up with some positive solutions. But, you know, and, and there are a lot of European North American countries also struggling with the same issues. Let's not forget that. But this was a study specifically focused on Africa. Thank you. Hello. Excuse me. In case you need more uh, data, I'll make myself available. Thank so you. You. Can, you can have a conversation afterwards. So thanks for everybody for coming. Um, thanks particularly to Rob for dealing with technical difficulties and to Sarah with the microphone. And thanks to all the speakers who dealt who. Um, did the talk in, t in time, it was fantastic.
I particularly like Sarah's talk about kind of type two decision making. I did think of the point she made when um, she said the people that learned bird calls and could instantly then recognise bird calls did make me think of a conversation we had a few months ago. Uh, we've got some cracking birders in our group. We know bird calls, but we still have a, had a half an hour long debate about a sound recording that was sent to us from Norwich and wondering whether it was a tinker bird, tropical tinker bird or a reversing lorry. Uh, we still had that. Um, there'll be an opportunity tonight to follow up some of these conversations. So I think people who are interested in the policy networking event, I think people are meeting at registration at seven, but if not, it's meeting at the Novotel. I think there's a free drink in it. So please do go and talk to some of the speakers who may well be there. Uh, but thank you. And it's a poster session now. <laughs>